now we'll welcome up Martin Lambert, Zach McKay, Telvin Stewart, and Kelly Stevis. But up first, Martin Lambert. Martin, thank you for being here. We're so excited to hear the story of Kawasaki Motors and how you all run PR launches. This is going to be an awesome conversation between these four, and um, Martin is going to kick it off for us. Martin, thanks for being here. Thank you. I'll talk about our relationship with, with Photo Shelter and what we use it for. And then really moving forwards into the latter part of the presentation, I'll talk about how we as a, as a manufacturer um, are looking towards uh, 2021 and beyond. A little bit about Kawasaki first. Most people know us because of uh, motorcycles. It's a Japanese-based multinational company, and it's, it's divided into two. They're not equal halves, but it's divided into two. One half is the consumer division, which is what I work for, and the other half is industrial products. That's more business to business. So you know about the motorcycles. Uh, in the American market, of course, we also sell uh, jet ski personal watercraft, which has become so popular that uh, jet ski is now a generic term for, for any personal watercraft. And then, of course, again, in the American market, side by side is a, a very popular uh, vehicle. So you know something about Kawasaki, perhaps. Also, we are manufacturers of, of big stuff, business to business stuff, aircraft, bridges, boats, uh, rolling stock. In fact, most of the uh, New York Metro, the, the trains are, are made by Kawasaki. So talking about photo shelter. Um, again, I, we are a couple of steps upstream, really, compared to something like the, the NFL. We use PhotoStream as an event-based tool. It is for us to support events, for product launches. And a bit later on, I'll, I'll talk about the effects of COVID on us. But before COVID came along, we were using uh, Photo Shelter for storing materials for uh, the events that we do. Our clients are only media clients, so there's no public access to uh, photo shelter for us. That's really for the, for the media to do, to use the materials and go on to the clients. So we're using it as a business to business tool. I'll just give you a quick example of one of our events. And it depends on how many models that we're gonna launch in a year, but some years we launch up to six uh, motorcycles and some years perhaps it's only three. Uh, this launch was just before COVID struck and it was in Las Vegas and we launched uh, a supercharged uh, motorcycle. We had 48 media um, at the event across four groups and that was eight days. We hosted it at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway and then we went up into the Valley of Fire uh, State Park to do photography and video there. Two things to tell you about the media, really, the, the media that we, we, we put on to uh, Photo Shelter for further distribution. Firstly, we have a, a thing called a generic press pack. So the two or three days before the launch starts, we create generic material. We use an unbranded rider and we make photographs and video and create materials that can be used by editors and by the media who aren't lucky enough to be at the event. So even if you don't come to one of our events, you can still access it by the Photo Shelter uh, link and you can make stories and editorial. If you are one of the guests, you do get an absolute cascade of material. And in a later slide, I'll, I'll describe how that um, relationship has evolved. On average at this event, each of the guests received nearly 300 images of themselves, high res images and also 55 pieces of video content. When you think that we're shooting in 4K industry standard uh, broadcast material for the video and high resolution for the images, and you double that up to 48 people having that sort of material, you can see that our, our need for uh, storage is, is immense. So even though we'd only do a few events a year, we have a lot of storage required. It's seasonal. That means that uh, we typically operate between October and uh, April the next year. That's when our motorcycles are launched. So that's when we're uploading material to the photo shelter. 
but we have a year round client demand. The media obviously use uh, photo shelter for downloading during the event. Uh, let's say a journalist is at the event, at the same time they're at the event, their editor is already downloading images of them and making up the story, whether that be for traditional printed media or digital media. And because we run global events, we have a global user audience. So our user audience or the people that are uh, accredited for photo shelter with us, um, they can go from Australia uh, through up to uh, North America, Canada, and into Russia and uh, Europe as well. So we've got a 24 seven need for uh, image access, 24 hour a day need for client support and innovation. So let's just talk quickly about our media journey. And it, it is different to what we've seen with NFL perhaps and some of the other people, because you've got to remember, we're slightly upstream. We're not actually uh, exposing this content. We're creating the content for other people to use. Our media journey was in basically four stages, four parts of the evolution. Stage one was the dark ages. Um, I've actually worked for Kawasaki for nearly 25 years now. So I, I've kind of got the hang of it now. Um, when I first joined Kawasaki, it was basic photography. We even took a dark room to events with us and uh, processed on site and gave journalists transparencies to take back with them. That was in the days when uh, magazines were monthly, when newspapers were daily, and people really had to wait for their information. Stage two was the moving image. This is when we started to integrate video, and of course, digital photography came along. And this started that journey towards where we're getting to today, where people want information, they want it now, and they want to be able to consume it. And perhaps there, there is some um, parity with what um, Russell and, and Jordan were saying, that it's, it's instant. Stage three is where we are now, where it's a real-time platform. As I say, there was there, you'll have situations where a, a rider will be on track, their images will be downloaded to a car, they'll be taken to the office, they'll be uploaded, and perhaps sometimes while the rider is still in the riding session, the images of them are going to be transferred to, let's say, a web story. And then fourth is tomorrow's world, what we're looking towards, how this is going to evolve, and perhaps even how people like Kawasaki, who are two or three stages upstream at the moment, will actually reach down and start having interaction with, with customers uh, direct. So let's just have a quick look at future thinking. We're, we're more or less getting towards the end of what I want to really speak to you about. But, um, it's been mentioned already, COVID has been mentioned already. But the thing that we appreciate was that change was coming anyway. Uh, whether COVID accelerated or decelerated or changed that, we don't know for sure at the moment, but change was coming. For the world that we inhabit and for the uh, motorcycle business for sure, uh, the media is changing. Paper and print media, media are reducing drastically. There will end up probably in, in the world that we're talking about be several quality uh, magazines or editorials which will be distributed maybe twice a year. But the, the main bulk of magazines are reducing down very quickly. Digital uh, communication now dominates. And when you think about it, something as dynamic and 3D as a motorcycle it's, it's a good evolution for us because uh, the excitement of a motorcycle is very difficult to transfer on a, on a page of paper. So from that point of view, the future looks brighter for us. Uh, lead times and access points are changing. Uh, we are living in a much more instant world of, of transfer of materials, transfer of ideas, but also we have to be agile and, and I, I was very interested in, in what the guys from NFL were saying about uh, some of the routes to market that they've got and some of the agility that they're um, showing us because 
that's something that we have to learn about agility and access points. It's not just a, a handheld device anymore. We have to be up to speed with that. And the relationship with the public and media is changing. The media still have a very strong role in the uh, chain of communication with Kawasaki. But as a company, we are realizing that we have some equity ourselves and that there is no real barrier between us communicating with the public directly. And that's something that's, that's a, a very small steps at the moment, but that's something that we're getting involved with uh, on a daily and weekly basis. And then really just looking backwards, perhaps a little bit towards the current situation we've got with Photo Shelter, the content demand is huge. Um, I said that at one of those events, journalists tip, typically get 300 images each, but I think all of us realize that the, the customer, the world is content hungry. And as much content as we can create can be consumed. And we are living in a 24 seven world. So we have to be able to create that content, to store that content and distribute that content. And really closing off what I wanted to say today is kind of pivoting towards 2021 for, for Kawasaki. What is the, the elements that we're looking at moving forwards towards a new future? The first thing is uh, communication channels. We heard in the previous presentation about TikTok and various other channels. And for us as a company, which is a, a large industrial company, which has traditionally been uh, like a super tanker. It's, it's difficult to turn a super tank around or to, or to change direction. We have to be much more agile and really consider which communication channels we're going to adopt, pick them up, drop them when another one comes along and change our kind of approach to that sort of philosophy. The corporate tone of voice is changing as well in terms of, uh, the, the manufacturer used to be the voice of authority, but of course now in our world, it's more peer-to-peer -peer communication and uh, peer approbation that's, that's dominating now. So if a customer talks to another customer and says, this motorcycle is good, that actually has uh, much more traction than uh, the manufacturer and traditional routes like traditional advertising. Uh, the next uh, bullet point I want to really speak about is perception product ratio. What does that mean? It means that, of course, we spend a lot of our time trying to perfect the very best motorcycles that we can. And you can see in that slide there, uh, several of our bikes now, you can actually uh, communicate and lock into the bike using Bluetooth and have a Bluetooth interaction with your motorcycle. So you can talk to your motorcycle using your handheld device. But that's only one part of the story. And I think for manufacturers, the realization is that it's not just about having the best products anymore. It's having the best perception of your brand as well. And one of the things that I think we'll be doing even more work on in, in 2021 and beyond is the, is the perception of our brand, not just the products that we are uh, manufacturing and selling. That means to stay ahead of the curve, we have to look at all possible innovations and the market itself. We won't stop making things, but crucially for us, it's the channels of communication, it's the partnerships that matter. And I suppose drawing this presentation to a close, that's one of the things that I wanted to sort of enforce that, yes, we're good at what we do, but looking outwardly as a manufacturer, there are things that we are not such experts at, things such as cloud storage that the that, that photo shelter offers. So for us, it's key partnerships going forward to enable us to do what we do well and for us to get into the line of sight of the media and customers and really present ourselves uh, as well as we can as a brand. And that's really all I want to say to you in this presentation. Thank you.
Amazing. Thank you so much, Martin. That was fantastic. I'm excited to bring you back for the Q&A. So I'll let you off the hook for now and bring up our team from UNC Charlotte. It's really cool to see how Martin and the team at Kawasaki share all of their amazing imagery with press stakeholders. And now we're going to dig into how to do this in college athletics. So welcome, Zach and Selvin. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Martin, you're off the hook for now, and then you can come back for the Q&A. Um, so feel free to turn your camera off, mute yourself for a second and take a little breather. And then we'll let the team from UNC Charlotte uh, share their screen and give us a look at what they're working on. And then we'll bring up Kelly from University of Wisconsin. And I know there's a little bit of chatter about NIL happening in the Slack channel right now. And she's got some fun stuff to share about that. So guys, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. No problem. Kristen, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. So I'll get going first and I'll just kind of share um, our process of going through an athletics rebrand of new logos in a, in a worldwide global pandemic, something I wouldn't recommend to, to many people. So we started this process uh, January, or early spring of 2019. Um, and it, it, overall, it was an evaluation process of taking a look at our current marks, which you see on the screen there. We had a primary mark and a secondary mark, but the overall goal was we didn't go into the the, the process um, wanting to make changes. The, the process started by we wanted to evaluate um, our, current, our current branding and just kind of get a feel for how it stood in the marketplace, how people, how, how, how our fans, how our key constituents felt about our current logo. So we went through the process by beginning with um, an evaluation phase of, of research and, 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 and surveying key, constitu key constituents um, email, emailing student athletes, alumni, um, season ticket holders, those people who had a really hands-on approach, um, with, uh, a really hands-on touch and feel to our logo, and just kind of feel for them of, hey, hey, what what are the things that you love about our logo? What are the what are the things that that that, that can be changed that you can still get a feel for? So what we learned from that process that the the most important parts of our existing our our previous mark was that people loved the green, loved the pickaxe, um, loved the nickname 49ers, um, but it wasn't so much an, an affinity to the overall look. So through the whole process, we just kind of followed where the, where the information took us. Um, and we found out, like I said, that the affinity wasn't so much to the logo itself, but just the overall um, color scheme. So the goal of the rebrand, and I know Telvin's kind of changed the graphic there, but the goal of the rebrand was to uh, what you see on the left is our previous mark seven. So if you want to go back real quick for me, uh, the 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 goal of the rebrand. So you see our our older marks on the left. So the goal of was to take something um, old and give it a a refreshed look. So um, working with our our marketing agency, um, the, the 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 company here locally that was helping us through the process. The goal was to take our old marks, uh, refresh it a little bit, um, find something that connected to the city. Um, find something that we knew, um, young alumni, students, people that, that like I said, were key constituents to our market, uh, would, would, would be able to enjoy long term, something that would, would last long term, something that would stand the test of, test of time. We, we heard a lot from vendors that our old logo was too many colors. As you see, it's a four color look. Um, it has the intricate parts of the hand, um, the pickaxe, the fingers of the logo. So we would see all the time when vendors would would try to make it into a one color process and they would change that they would they would they would misprint the the fingers or the color scheme would be off so we just had a lot of challenges of vendors putting the logo on t-shirts and hats and cups and obviously a logo with that much detail as you scaled it down you lose some of the some of the parts of it so we, we we knew we needed to make changes. So as you see on the on the right there is that's what we unveiled this summer. Um, so it was, it was a new mark that you can see. Uh, the goal was like I said the connection to the city. So we went with the CLT as a secondary mark. Um, CLT is really really big here on the East Coast, City of Charlotte. A lot of people can resonate with the CLT being the the airport abbreviation code. But we wanted to keep some of the same elements. Um, as the old logo as a part of that. So you see the pickaxe is still a part of the, the C using it, the pickaxe as, as the negative space there. Uh, then also a unique feature of the primary markets, it's slanted at a nine degree angle 
um, with to, to represent 49ers and, and our and our forward momentum as an institution. Um, Kevin, you can kind of change. So with the rebrand, um, our, our goal was obviously um, was one to have a huge big event, a huge big event to, to launch the logo. Uh, we wanted to have a, a full scale party. I mean, obviously the goal was would, would be to have student athletes and in all the uniforms, um, apparel on sale, and just the, the whole shebang for a big party and event. But obviously 2020 had had, had different plans for us for that. So. We went back and forth several times of, of changing the launch date. It was originally going to be in May, uh, right around graduation, the end of school year. We wanted to send off our our, our, our students into the summer with uh, tons of energy, just in the school year with a, with a big bang. Um, and then once that didn't happen, we, we, we decided to, hey, let's move it to August and, and go into another school year with, with, with tons of energy. Um, that got that got nixed as well too. And what we saw was, I guess the overall goal was we didn't want to launch, we, we didn't want to do this in the middle of, of of the pandemic with campus on a pause status. But over the course of time, we realized that this was going to be our new norm. We were going to be in quarantine for quite some time. Um, socially, socially distancing was going to be a, a, a common theme for this year. So we decided to move it up into June because we we saw too a lot of the the NFL jerseys were being were being revealed. We saw other collegiate programs um, on building that logo. So we felt like we could jump on board and, and really give, give our fans something that they could attach to. Um, obviously, the the, being, the beginning of the pandemic was really hard on a lot of people. So we wanted to give our fans something they could celebrate um, and, and get excited about. So we ended up launching it in um in, in the middle in the middle of june uh, we launched it with a youtube live virtual event um, it was it was an mc by our athletic director and our deputy ad for external they really just kind of set down kind of a, a town hall setting uh and really gave our fans uh the background to to, to the unveiling of, of how we got to this point talk about the research we did talking about working with uh, a local designer who is an, an alum of the institution. Um, the organization we worked with in town really were hands-on with us throughout the entire process, really had roots within UNC Charlotte. They were, a lot of the people that worked at the, the branding agency were alums of the, of the institution. So they really had a, a real important touch and feel to, to what we did. But as you see on the screen there, it just kind of showed you some parts of our launch. Um, the image on the bottom right there was a part of our Essence video. So the Essence video was more of a long form video that, that took that took fans through the history of the not only athletics, but the entire institution. The image there is one of the first images of the original campus. Uh, one, one or two buildings there that's just kind of the start of what's now UNC Charlotte. The image on the left um, was part of our Bold Rush hype video. That was more of a, a short form video, really quick hitting that showed fans um, the new logo on football jerseys, on apparel, on different logos and just different places. Because we, we knew what, once we unveiled it, people would resonate better to it once they saw it on items. Obviously, a flat logo on a flat surface can only give you so much. But once you start seeing it on helmets, jerseys, arena floors, hoodies, sweatshirts, all those things, it, it, gave, it gave fans a better look to the overall mark. Um, and, and just with, with launching it in June, obviously, like I said, with, with the pandemic, we weren't able to have all of our elements in place at that time. So we knew then it would be more of a staggered launch throughout the course of the summer um, into the fall once we resumed um, athletic activity. So like I said, the launch was in, in, in June. Then we knew we would stagger it out. So uh, once we got into August, we, we unveiled the new basketball arena. Once we got into August and September, we unveiled um, fall sports uniforms, volleyball jerseys, soccer jerseys, um, men's soccer, women's soccer. Um, one unique part about this is we did, actually didn't get football uniforms in until the Friday evening before the first home before the first football game on that Saturday. So we we weren't able to build up the football unveiling as we had hoped. So they were actually unveiled on national TV um, for our first football game as an away game. So that was that was a, un a unique approach that they were first seen on TV before we were able to do anything with them. So that was that. But just overall going forward, um, we've worked with a local vendor here in town that shows you those two images of the hoodie uh, and the tracksuit. They've been tremendous with us. It's a 
It's a shop here in town called 704 Shop. They're all alums. Um, and, the, and the guy featured there is a, is a former football student athlete who they've been tremendous with unveiling just hoodies and track, shoot, track suits and, and face masks and t-shirts throughout the summer that we've been continuing pushing out to our fans and, and just building awareness. But overall, going forward, obviously with a with new brand, we wanted to saturate the market the marketplace as much as possible with trying to get, get out as much content as we could to our student athletes wearing the new apparel. Um, so our, our partnership with Photo Shelter, and we actually work with Influencer to push imagery to our athletes. I mean, just from the month of October alone, we pushed out over 4,000 pictures and in, in content to, to our football student athletes. Um, with that being said, I mean, they were able to, with, with, them, with them posting and knowing how people follow people, um, they were able to reach an audience of over 200,000 people just from our Facebook, just from our football student athletes alone. So it's been just tremendous for us of, of doing as much as we can to provide student athletes with with content to tell their story and to overall enhance our brand um, and put our new logo out there. So I'll turn it over to Telvin now that he'll be able to talk about from the, the creative side of, of what he's doing and just different things that he's doing to continue to, to push our brand and, and give our student athletes uh, content to tell their own story. So thank you, Zach. So I would say the best thing about rebranding is all the new assets that we get and the hardest thing about rebranding is, again, all the new assets that we get, because it's fun at first, you know, we're trying to rebuild our brand. We're coming out with all these new graphics and we get to figure out, you know, how can we use this in a, in a good way or how can we use this logo in a good way? But at the same time, it can be challenging. So my job as a graphic designer is to take what we get, um, particularly from LGA, all the graphics and assets that they provided us and see what we can do with it. In this case, they created a really cool basketball court design, which, you know, I, it's my job to take apart and see what I can do. So the next example is something that we came with up with for Twitter. Initially, when we launched, we were met, we were met with a mixed review for the logo. Um, some people were here, some people were really hyped about it. But as we gradually started to roll out with images on social media, like jerseys, helmets, um, shoes, all the new gear, the morale of the town really started to go up. So this is an image that we came up with for Twitter and Instagram, and it really blew people away. So from there, um, from there we started to roll out more apparel. Um, our football uniforms came in, as Zach said, and people loved it. They went crazy for it, especially when they seen Coach Healy wearing everything. You see him in the face mask and the visor, and then the assistant coaches with all their gear on. Everybody wanted it all of a sudden. So. As a graphic designer, I kind of have to see what I can do with the primary logo and the secondary logo and kind of see how I can use that to, you know, create really cool graphics. So speaking of graphics, um, this is kind of what I do. I, all the pictures that we take at football games, basketball games, volleyball games this upcoming season, they go straight to Photo Shelter. And from Photo Shelter, um, I kind of pick and choose the best pictures. And from there, I'm sorry, from here, we're all about emotional pictures. So this is a really great picture that we came up with last week for Tariq Harris, who um, was a Campbell Trophy finalist. And our goal this year was to really get back to the core colors um, for Charlotte, which is green and white. Um, so we kind of built that into most of our graphics and limited the goal this time around. In addition to that, we kind of wanted to focus on the city um, background of Charlotte um, even more. So we kind of we try to incorporate that into pretty much all the graphics that we do with limited gold as well. But Photo Shelter has granted us the ability to get you know photos almost instantly after the football game um, happens. And then we kind of take all those pretty cool pictures and come up with really cool graphics. Like when we played our first home game, we came up with this wear bag graphic, which features like some of our best players. And then the game day graphics, which features our um, star quarterback, Chris Reynolds. And it's Photo Shelter has really given us the ability to do all those things. Um, that's why we love it and we use it so much. But um, it's been like a great transition as far as rebranding. Um, we use the logos on, you know, everything to the best of our ability. And so far it's came out, it's coming out great. And we're really excited about the future um, for all that Charlotte has to offer. So we'll be coming out with some, uh, a lot of cool more graphics soon. So, but thank you guys very much. This was a great presentation. And I want to say thank you to Zach for like allowing us to do you know all this cool stuff with charlotte athletics and look out for our basketball season starting next week fingers crossed
So exciting. Thank you both so much. Your graphics look amazing. I love the rebrand. Everything is so fresh and it looks so good. I want to welcome up Kelly and then we're going to have these two back on for our Q&A with Martin as well. Kelly from the University of Wisconsin, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Hi. Hi, Kelly. Can you hear me? Great so everyone get Hello. excited because I was cracking up during her run through the other day and you're going to love her presentation. It's going to be great. And I know a lot of people are chatting about NIL, so that's going to be um, definitely uh, relatable and really interesting. So Kelly, if you want to hit play, I'll let you take it away. Um, good girl. You're hyping me up too much. Oh my gosh. Um, Never. <laughs> okay. So I just, um, I'm going to keep it real in mind. Uh, 2020 has been a really, really strange year. Um, there's been a lot of stages of it. We went through Carol Baskin. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my screen time on TikTok is up at a really, really shameful amount. Um, everything's in Zoom, but you know what? We're doing the things. It's happening. Here we are. Um, just a little thing on my life. My year started nice and happy at the Rose Bowl in LA. Here I am with Melvin Gordon. Everything's great. And here I am trying to figure out how I'm going to be able to shoot practice photos and make them look even like close to decent from um, several feet away. So it's been a lot of different um, adjustments and it's been really strange, but we're doing it and it's all good. Um, so my biggest lesson this year, I think, is to expect the unexpected. There's been so many different things thrown our way and so many different um, strange situations, but I think the best thing to do in 2020 is to roll with the punches and just try to figure it out. So we have had a lot of questions, a lot that were, how do we stay connected with our fans, even though we're really far apart? Um, how do we show recruits how great Madison is without being able to bring them in? How do we support our athletes in their social justice causes and just general branding their um, profiles as they want when we can't be with them and we can't be in front of them. So how do we still tell our story? That's what we like to, we always zero back in on. That's our jobs. We're storytellers and at our core, that's what we do. But how can you tell the story when you're far from the story that's happening and you have to tell it in a different way? So that being said, we had to really bring out the creative juices and figure out different ways to do that. Um, I feel like my main man stitch over here, like these have been my personal stages of quarantine. Um, I don't know about you guys. Um, so I'll start at the beginning, back in March, April, whenever the heck this all started. I feel like the sort of like reaction to all this was to do all the things. Like the very initial thing was to panic and like, we need to do this. We need to do this hand washing graphic. We need to do this. We need to do this social media. We truly needed to just like entertain ourselves. Um, we were doing so many things to try to entertain parents that had kids at home and trying to send out coloring pages, trying to send out this. We did a ton of that. And we kind of stopped ourselves halfway through and we're thinking, this isn't, this isn't it. Like, it's great. And so many people are doing that, but it's getting away from our story and it's getting away from who we are as storytellers. We need to kind of zero back in, come back, reel it back and try to figure out what we need to do here to still like connect with our fans, still tell the story. Our athletes are at home. Like how can we show these different things? So we pivoted and we started to come back to connecting with the players and connecting them with the fans and bringing back good memories instead of just like focusing on all that so that our players were in masks they we had a whole mask campaign and they're going through it too we I had a, a player that did a TikTok of how much McDonald's he ordered I mean like we can all relate right um so we just really wanted to get back to our social media being the gateway of how we tell our story 
and instead of sort of just like hopping on every trend. So for us, it's, I mean, it's been a strange year for everybody, but it's been a super strange year for us. We have had to, I feel like we have made a plan and then the plan changed like 20 more times, which it is what it is, 2020. But we started out, you know, like after pro day, season gets canceled, players go home, whatever. Um, then when the Big Ten canceled our season, we had to come up with a way to figure out how to A, stay relevant in people's minds and to still connect with our fans and have some sort of relationship there, especially if we weren't gonna be playing. And also we needed to generate revenue in some way or fashion. So uh, a great group of minds that I work with came up with this idea of a dream season, which was us taking some of the best games, which there was a lot of debate over this, trust me, um, but some of the best games in our history and replaying those on Saturday, but not just replaying the game because that's not enough. That wouldn't have been enough to just entertain people. We built an entire campaign around it. Um, so as a social group, we got together and we came up with social elements that would be entertaining every single day. Stuff that A, we could sell to sponsors, but stuff that would actually entertain people that they have never seen before. Um, so we used an app called Zio to have a second screen experience when they're watching the game that shows interviews during it. It has people talking, but they could also take polls, take quizzes, do trivia. We did a weekly trivia, which was really fun through Zoom and had former players on there. We had our radio guy who people just absolutely love. Um, different things like that, just to still be able to connect. And we had these fan prize packages and it was kind of fun because it really truly was a way to actually connect with our fans again and really get that engagement up again and be able to give them something and give them something different with never before seen interviews, um, a lot of them on Zoom. So it was really different, but it was really neat to see everybody pull together and come with this creative idea. It took everybody, it took several people, um, but it was a really neat thing and then our season uh came back which was even better so we stopped dream season and started playing real football um but i'm going ahead there so come back kelly um so during all this dream season going on and that's the way that we connected with our fans but we also needed a way to connect with our current players and connect with recruits and um I'm not gonna make assumptions about what people think, but I am not originally from Wisconsin. And so when I pictured Wisconsin, when I was interviewing for the job, I could only think of cheese and farm fields and like dairy. But Madison is actually the capital, which is where the University of Wisconsin is. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And I'm biased because I live here, but it's really beautiful. There's, it's surrounded by lakes, it's a great place. and trying to connect with recruits and show them all these things without them actually being here is really a difficult situation to be in. So we had to get creative about the videos that we were putting on social and things that we were putting in the Instagram stories that were absolutely targeted towards recruits um, that people just saw like, oh, they're putting pretty pictures up of Madison. And it was like, no, the entire intention about that was to try to show it off. We used players to do that as well. Um, putting stuff on their own pages so that we could actually connect with these guys. Um, my next slide. Oh, okay. So now we're getting into my favorite part. Uh, my very favorite part of the job is to connect with the student athletes and to tell their story. That's literally what I do. That's what I love about it is to be able to give them what they want and give them the ability and help them with all the tools that they need. So, like I said, it's been challenging not being able to be around them. But one of my favorite things that we did during this was have just FaceTime calls with them. I had FaceTime calls with players 
um, every week and would schedule them to talk about their own personal branding, how what they want on their page, especially with NIL stuff coming up. It's really important to connect about that and to have just real conversations of how do we get you verified? What can we do to get you more followers? What can that be? Is it you taking over the Instagram of the football page so that we can get you a quick, easy few hundred based on our follower and like how to leverage that? and use that to our advantage. Like, do you need more photos? Which is where Photo Shelter comes into play and where um, we use Influencer as well. So they're integrated. So how can we get that stuff easily to you? Same thing with videos, highlight videos. How do we get you that stuff that you want that? Some players, that's it's not all about the action photos that they want. Some of them are doing stuff like over here where they did a charity walk for the Black Man in Madison, which was amazing. And they did that all on their own. However, it's giving them the freedom to say like, hey, you want us to take a fancy photo of you and edit it and we'll shoot it to you right away? Perfect, that's what we'll do. So it's just about, I think having those conversations and opening up that dialogue was pretty incredible to hear what they want and be able to quickly and easily communicate about that. Um, so I got a couple things going on over here. One example to the left over here, my main man, Adam Crumholt. He took it upon himself when we were talking in these like meetings about what can we do? How do we like better brand you? What do you want? And he was like, in social justice initiatives, I really, really want to use my social and the football social to advance my brand and but not just my brand I want to do some good with it and I was like yes that's exactly what you're supposed to do thank you um so he started working with a local charity in the Madison community and he raised thousands and thousands of dollars on his own profile and went to Costco picked up stuff for low-income families and distributed it and leverage this all on his social media and like it was like such a proud mom moment of like yes this is exactly what you're supposed to be using your social for it's incredible that you thought about that that you needed that help and that you really like asked for it and we were able to get him there and able to do all these things and put it on the football profile so that it reached more and more people so that was that was nice um and then over on the right well it stopped scrolling but you get the idea we also had the NFL draft during all this, which was really wild. Um, and through all this, like 2020 has been weird, like quarantine has been weird, like COVID is really weird, like awful. Um, but it has allowed us to like take a breather and take a step back and really focus in on some things in a good way. So stuff like what Adam did, but also the NFL draft, like we really were able to seriously zero in on the content that we were like producing for it. And we were able to give our players tons of content um, that were getting drafted because we wanted to make videos that really truly connected them to a new fan base and showed who they were. We wanted to show fan bases what kind of players they were getting like an actual highlight plays, but just their personalities too. They're incredible people. And whenever they get drafted to a new team, we had a window of time with that NFL fan base where they're looking at our profile and they're looking at this new player profile and what can we do to take advantage of that moment. And I think it was a really neat thing to do to be able to really truly focus on what we were putting out in that moment, which not that we hadn't before, but there was absolutely no excuse this time. We were all in our homes. It was all we were thinking about and it was all we were doing in that moment. Um, so. This is just more pictures of my players. I just like showing them off. Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> I think what's really been important to us, especially with NIO, but all the things going on in the world was to make sure that we are giving the players the tools that they need. Um, like I said before, like using influencer, using photo shelter, but just talking to them about what they want. They wanted to do all this social justice stuff on their own, but how could we help them? So they organized their own march 
and let us know about it so that we could be there. We could capture pictures for them so that they could reach their own fan bases. Um, mask up campaigns. A lot of that was on their own too. They wanted to be able to push that message out because they realized that their audience is a little bit different than ours. So that is something that I'm very proud of these little boys. Um, and I'm gonna end it. <laughs> this is cheesy and I don't care. Um, I feel like people need to hear it. As creatives and as people in social, we uh, it's been really strange. I feel like we've been through the motions as people who are on our phones all the time. It's been a little bit jarring to have to adjust to the way that the world is working for social people right now. Um, and especially with there's so much going on with furloughs and layoffs and whatnot. And I just want to say to all creatives, you're doing great. No one has ever navigated a global pandemic and social media and branding ever before. So I don't think there's like a right or wrong answer. And moving forward to 2021, it's going to be just as weird. Like there's going to be so many different things, but it's incredible to see how many creative people are coming up with so many good ideas. So just keep doing the best you can. Be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself because a strange time and you know take a break watch some shit's creek i did binged it it was great but you know just keep doing the best you can and get creative because it's weird <laughs> kelly what a perfect way to finish out that conversation we want to invite all of our guests back up for a q a i am a big fan so love the gift at, gift at the end it was perfect and I think your message is spot on I think this is a really tough time and you know we're not through it yet and I am just so grateful that all of you have taken the time to spend the day with us to get inspired today because I think everybody kind of needs it still um, I want to invite our other three panelists back up Martin yep okay awesome the team from Charlotte is back great so to start out we had a great question from Sharani which I think is like a little bit of a rhetorical question but I'd love for you guys to answer it in like a very advice sort of way you know how do we stay connected when you're apart what's your best advice for making feel people feel a little more connected right now Kelly we'll start with you I think to think about what you want when you're on social I know that sounds like like kind of dumb and easy but when I was scrolling through social of like things that I actually wanted to engage with and things that I actually found entertaining or something that I cared about it sounds simple but like just thinking about what could entertain you in that moment too and it's it's difficult with all of this to get engagement and um, there's so much flooding the social world right now too to be able to stand out in those moments but just trying to hone in on what can actually connect you. Zach any advice from you? Yeah I would just say I mean be genuine try to stay true to your brand like as Kelly talked about during the pain I mean during the peak of the summer like everyone's trying to do coloring books and mass campaign like everyone's just trying to keep up with each other and you have to really sit down and and, and reevaluate and just like, okay, what's important to the Charlotte fan base? And let, let's get let's get back to that. So I would just say try to be genuine and post content that that you find interesting yourself that you think your fans will 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 connect with as well. Yep. Telvin. Yeah, I would say one thing as a team, what we do is we all kind of follow all the same accounts and then we give suggestions on like TV shows to watch. So as a team, we always stay connected and whatever we see on those social platforms, it's like, okay, I saw this or Zach may see that or Ali may see that. How can we take what we saw and kind of use that to communicate to our fan base and kind of turn that into like a pretty cool graphic or animation or video? So that's kind of how we all kind of stay connected when we're apart. Yep. Martin, how about you? It's actually been a very interesting time and, and I'm going to try and put a positive spin on it. Um, what it's done is it's it's given us a chance to be quite reflective and 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 Zach made a good point. It 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 gives you a chance to be authentic. You know, it gives you a chance to dismiss what's superficial and and come up with you know authentic messages. And at the same time, just speaking from our perspective, we've been making motorcycles for fifty plus years. And 
we are always talking about the here and now, and it suddenly made us think, well, hang on a minute, we've got all of these people who can't ride their motorcycles sitting at home, bored, sitting in front of their computers. We've got 50 years of heritage that we could show them. And for us, it was like unlocking that and thinking, God, you know, this is this is brilliant. It, it, you know, it was an opportunity to to kind of think about what it felt like for people in lockdown and think, well, if I was one of those people, what would I want, you know, Wisconsin Athletic or Charlotte to, to, to show me, to do me? And, and it gave us a chance to think about ourselves from the point of view of a, a customer and think, what's the kind of cool things that they would want? And for us, that, that kind of unlocked a great deal of engagement. It's not just about the here and now, it's about, you know, heritage and authenticity. So it, it, we saw it, you know, without making it sound like, you know, day is night, it, it actually became a bit of an opportunity. I love that. I love that. And thank you all for this amazing session. It's really been uh, informative and, um, one question I wanted to ask um, was just about uh, the seasons, right? The, whether it's football or you mentioned your basketball season starting up or um, some of the races, you know, we, it's kind of on again, off again. It's canceled. It's not canceled. Um, how do you guys adjust to that? You know, how, and how far in advance do you know? Kind of what's the communication process between the university or the team or whoever's deciding all the way to your own workflows. Um, Telvin or Zach, you guys want to start with that one? I mean, I think for us this year, it's definitely been a challenge. Uh, let's just say as far as knowing how far in advance things happen, but um, we try to adjust as best as we can um, by putting out like social announcements or or graphics for other sports. Um, but yeah, we try to do the best we can. And Zach, you kind of want to chime in. Yeah, like Tobin said, I mean, for us, like the football season has been really challenging. We've probably had, I guess, four or five games canceled now um, throughout the season. And typically we find out Friday afternoon of the cancellation. So you've gone through the entire week, promoted the game, and then Friday it's like, oh, JK, what we did all week is, is now irrelevant that we're not going to play tomorrow. Um, but we, I, I think our, our, our football account's been really good that tried to change the narrative on Saturdays and Sundays. We we try to highlight um, some guys in the NFL, how they're playing on Sundays to like, hey, we let you down on Friday. But hey, look at our, our alumni doing really good in the NFL on Sundays to try and change the narrative. And then into the next week, it's like, OK, we forgot about last week. Let's talk about the guys back 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 at practice. Um, um, guys awards and like, like the graphic Telvin show it's a graphic of um, Tyreek Harris um, one of our standout seniors on, on football team he's a tremendous student athlete um, really gives back to community does a does a ton of community service a lot of it on his own so we try to do that on the weekends highlight guys that and what they're doing off the field uh, academic awards community service awards so we try to change the narrative um, on the weekends when games get canceled and like, okay, you're, you're down about the game not playing, but like, hey, we still we still have amazing student athletes on this campus, so let's let's let's, let's talk about them right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martin, how about, <clears throat> excuse me, how about you? Um, it's a little bit different for me because uh, uh, another part of my uh, my job at Kawasaki is looking after the communication for our racing uh, teams, our top level racing teams. So for me, it's uh, World Motocross and World Superbike. Uh, World Motocross started the year visiting 21 countries across the year. The, the calendar changed three times. It gradually shrunk and you know, they went to countries where you could race. Because you can imagine that's like a whole village traveling around the world. People coming from different countries and, you know, that's a COVID nightmare. So that changed enormously and, and, and they coped. Uh, with World Superbike, it went down from, I think, about 13 rounds to about eight rounds. And the same thing, you know, we're sending people there, photographers, videographers, they've all got to do their, their COVID tests and they've got to try and get to the circuit. The key thing I think about it is that not only do you have an awful lot of really determined people 
that, that want to make things happen. By doing that, they find ways of making it happen. And again, that's where kind of photo shelter comes in. The, the photographer sitting there with a with a card stuck in the side of his computer and he's waiting for an aeroplane. Is it delayed? He can just upload to photo shelter and someone can download the stuff. And it's like a river going to the ocean. It will find its way eventually. It might not be in a straight line. It might take some curves and, and do whatever. But what we're doing, especially in a COVID situation, is we're feeding people's passion. There's people sitting there, they're, you know, they're awake in the morning, they're awake in the afternoon, they're awake late into the night. They may be stuck in their houses and we're just giving them a, you know, a little bit of hope. I'm not saying it's the whole answer, but for like motorcycle fans, you know, just one little picture or something like that, it just makes such a difference to their day. So we were trying to facilitate and help just bring that across. And, and I think, a lot of people have done a lot of amazing work to to make it happen and, and people who are stuck in their houses i think they're very grateful yeah i love that um kelly absolutely i know badger fans are just like that as well um what yeah. about what about your your team how have you guys adjusted uh on the fly if anyone's got this figured out please let me know slide into my dms because it has been <laughs> quite the trip um like i said we had the first part of our season canceled and then we had a new schedule and then we had another new schedule um so it was kind of strange but we have had to like make so many different adjustments and try to figure out like when are we playing like it was kind of just like a acceptance of like we're gonna have to figure out how to do this on the fly we're good at our jobs we're just gonna have to figure it out and then we played our first game, which is great. We won, yay. Um, and then we got canceled for our next two because of COVID. So um, that was like being up like so high, like, yeah, we did it. We figured it all out with all these adjustments of getting tested and like all this stuff. And like, we've got all these people in the stadium. You're going to stand over in this corner, this and this. We're like, we did it. And then we got canceled the next two games. So that was like a okay, now what do we do? Um, but I think for us, it was, instead of just putting out a, like, a canceled graphic and just calling it good, we really did try to um, appeal to the, like, human being side of it, and we were trying to put out cool graphics and let people know that our coaches and our players were really sad about it. Like, it, they're human beings. They're not just football players and coaches. They're literal human beings, and they were pretty heartbroken about not playing, and that was a really big adjustment for them too. And so we were really trying to put that human side out there of like, this is, this is weird. I don't know. We're all like trying to figure it out. We're trying to get there and deal with it all um, day by day. And that was kind of the most that you could do is deal with it day by day of there's something new, there's adjustments every single day. And I think you just kind of got to be ready for anything and ready to go and trying to figure it all out. <laughs> For sure. 